And I have to say, it's also just a, a real pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Natterson Horowitz today to you all. Um, uh, like many, I first got to know about her work when I encountered her book, Zubiquity, um, which, uh, if you don't know, was a fantastic, terrific bestseller that explores the, the connections, um, uh, you know, explores diseases across many species and looks at, at um, the ways in which you can, uh, by taking an interspecies approach to disease, can think of new ways of understanding diseases, treating them and preventing them. And it's a really a groundbreaking book. It's a compelling and delightfully written read. And if you haven't read it, I urge you to rush out and, and buy it. Um, it's, it's, uh, and it's also been an important uh, component of, of the field of evolutionary medicine, which is a, still a nascent field. It's a growing field about that it really thinks about how to apply um, evolutionary theory and data to questions of health and disease. And um, I'm a firm believer that evolutionary medicine will eventually become a very important uh, field, but at the moment it's still struggling, um, partly because uh, it takes a lot of work to convince uh, a traditionally conservative field, medicine, to start thinking about health and disease in some different ways, which evolutionary biology certainly can. And, and, and Dr. Natterson Horowitz is really on the forefront of that and, in fact, has just been elected president of the, of the, um, the Society for Evolutionary Medicine and Public Health to rec recognize her achievements and her, and her, and her in interests in this area. Anyway, that's how I first got to know her, through her book, Zubiquity. But I actually uh, first met her at a conference and uh, over a drink at the bar, discovered that um, she was uh, interested in taking a sabbatical to Harvard, uh, where, she, um, where she was an undergraduate. And I jumped at the, at the chance. And, and I'm really delighted to say that she's been a, a visiting professor here this year. She taught a class this fall on evolutionary medicine, which was extremely popular. And this spring, as she's teaching a, a course called um, uh, coming, in a, coming of Age in the Modern World, and students have just been flocking to her courses and raving about them. So, um, and, and what's actually very exciting is that we've convinced her to stay on for another year, so she's gonna do a double, so that's been really great. <clears throat> now, although she's a Californian born and bred, uh, as I mentioned before, she was an undergraduate here at Harvard. Then she did her MD at University of California, San Francisco, and then has had a long distinguished co career at UCLA Medical School, where she arose to the ranks. She started off as a resident and fellow in psychiatry, but then did a career switch and then moved into cardiology. So she's both a psychiatrist and a cardiologist, which is, if you think about it, a really useful combination. <laughs> um, and um, she's now also a, and she's a professor of cardiology at the Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA, but she's also a professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology there. And she's published and lectured extremely widely um, and is now working on a new book, which I look forward to seeing. So I should also end by saying that every single Harvard student I've met uh, who's taken her courses just rave about just how wonderful they are, uh, but she's an amazing teacher, she's incredibly dedicated, she's incredibly knowledge, she's got a unique perspective and a lot of passion. And so now it's your chance uh, to, to experience what some of the students in our department have been experiencing and listening to her thoughts about, about wild diagnosis, human health, and animal kingdom. So it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Nadison Horowitz. Thank you, Dan. That is the nicest introduction I have ever gotten, and um, so meaningful, because I'm having such a wonderful time here this year. And thank you to uh, Jane Pickering and Diane Munn for putting this together in the museum, because it's just been absolutely thrilling. Um, I'm going to thank a couple of other people as we move along. We are in the midst of a medical crisis, right? There is an epidemic of heart disease, an epidemic of cancer, we have explosive rates of obesity, and certain mental illnesses are increasing, particularly anxiety in, in young people. And there has been a global, a tremendous global research effort to uh, aimed at arresting and even reversing these problems. But despite that, we are looking at 800,000 Americans dying of a heart attack or a stroke this year, 600,000 dying of cancer. And obesity, well, rates of obesity have tripled at least since 1980, and so on and so on. And the research that's being done, I mean, it's very broad ranging from the basic molecular level to informatics to epidemiology. But I have a, 
a, an idea. And in fact, I'm going to use today to convince you that there's an approach, an approach that has been overlooked, which could really have um, a significant impact, make an impact. But that approach will require physicians and nurses and dentists and optometrists and patients to move from our homo sapien-centric point of view to expand the window through which we see health and disease. And I'm going to try to convince you that we can do that by taking human medicine and bringing in veterinary medicine, animal medicine, and evolutionary biology. And that by doing that, we can begin asking different questions, sparking novel hypotheses that can lead to investigation which may result in insights leading to preventive strategies and maybe, possibly, even cures. Well, I'm going to tell you why I, why I believe that's true by telling you a story. But before I do, I want to point out that we have an amazing um, opportunity tonight. It's really a privilege. Thanks to the Museum of Comparative Zoology, to uh, Mark Omura and Hopi Hookstra, we um, have specimens from the collection here tonight. And as I move through the talk, and I'm going to mention lots and lots of animals, some of those animals are actually represented um, here in the, the collection. And um, afterwards, I invite everybody to, to come up to take a look, not to touch the specimens, but to look at them. And we can have a very, hopefully, interesting comparative conversation that's been fueled by the words I'm going to have tonight. So with that, let me start my story, which is really kind of a tale of two hospitals. So as Dan said, I've been a cardiologist, a clinical cardiologist for almost 25 years here at UCLA, Ronald Reagan Hospital, taking care of human beings with heart attacks and high cholesterol. And, um, and then one day, um, I got a telephone call, which I'm going to tell you about in a second, but it really changed my life. Um, the kind of cardiology that I was practicing, so I was a general cardiologist, and then I had advanced training in cardiac imaging. And for years, I've been working on a project um, with our electrophysiologists to develop little tiny uh, cameras to put on the tip of catheters that are a little bit thicker than a piece of spaghetti. And we would take these catheters and we'd put them in the heart to visualize other catheters, which were trying to find about a one to two millimeter ridge of tissue at the connection between the posterior wall of the left atrium and the pulmonary veins. Why am I telling you that? Because it's indicative of what you do in academic medicine, right? You go deeper and deeper and deeper into a topic, and literally trying to find um, inside the heart a little bit of tissue. But as a consequence, you get narrower and narrower and narrower. And that's where I was when I got this telephone call. And the call came actually from one of the veterinarians here, which was the Los Angeles Zoo Animal uh, Hospital, the health center. They were calling because one of their chimpanzees didn't seem right, and they were worried that she had had a stroke. And they wanted to know if I would come and image her heart. And I should take a moment to say that the veterinarians at the Los Angeles Zoo and zoos around North America and Europe are outstanding doctors. They are board certified in zoo medicine. Um, and they you know, do a beautiful job taking care of their patients. But on occasion, particularly for great apes, um, for obvious reasons, they reach into the human medical community for imaging assistance. And I was one of these lucky cardiologists who got that call. Well, I remember the first uh, time that I went to the zoo. It was very exciting. Here was Pandora. She was my patient. And uh, this is my imaging catheter. It's um, an ultrasound. And this is a procedure that I was doing about 20 of them a week on human patients. And I'd been doing that for years, but I'd certainly never done it on a non-human patient. But by the time I got to the to the zoo hospital, the patient was, Pandora was already um, intubated, she was on a ventilator, and um, so I did my imaging procedure. And I'm going to come back to Pandora in a few minutes. So I went back to the other hospital, the human hospital, and resumed taking care of my human patients. But a few weeks later, I got a call about a gorilla. They wanted to know uh, if I could image this gorilla's heart because uh, they were concerned that there might be a, a tear in the aorta. The aorta is the large artery that comes off of the heart. And so I did that. And then I went back to UCLA, and I took care of my human patients. But I have to say that I kept waiting for the next call. I was, I was hooked pretty early. 
I had a chance to go to the zoo and image a wide range of patients. What a privilege, a mandrill, of howler monkeys. There were capuchin, there were a number of tamarind species um, and marmoset. And even eventually, I, I think I won their trust, and so they started calling me for a range of other species, a taper, a hunt, African hunting dog, a black bear. It was thrilling. And then one day, they called me because there was a California condor um, that, that had one of the veterinarians had heard a heart murmur. So, um, and I actually, they let me listen with my stethoscope, and I heard bum 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 so there was, uh, it just sounded like a human heart murmur. Um, and in fact, uh, we did an ultrasound on the heart. And just so you know, this is an ultrasound of the heart. And this is one of the leaflets of a valve, of a heart valve. And you can see that it's torn, right? It should connect over here. So there was a torn leaflet on the valve of this, the heart valve of this condor. It was a thrilling experience. I should tell you, I'm going to brag a little bit about the LA Zoo because the LA Zoo has been part of a really important conservation effort on, part, uh, on, the part, on behalf of the condor, uh, because California condors about 20 years ago were severely endangered. And this uh, program, which involved the San Diego Zoo, the LA Zoo, and some conservation biologists from Mexico, um, has resulted in um, a, a very stable and viable population of free living condors. So this was just thrilling. And then one day, one of the veterinarians called me because Cookie, who was a lioness at the zoo, had accumulated about 750 cc's of fluid in the sac in which her heart was contained, in the pericardium. And um, this is Cookie after this procedure. And this was a, just an amazing moment where we had a veterinary surgeon, we had human cardiologists, we had a human anesthesiologist, and other veterinarians, and collectively, we drained the fluid from Cookie's heart. And this is a procedure, by the way, that I had done on hundreds of human patients. And the procedure itself was incredibly similar in this lion and in, in human beings, um, except that for that paw <laughs> and that tail. Well, I mean, I was really hooked. This was in an incredible privilege, extremely exciting. Uh, but as great as the procedures were, the rounds were even better. So before we would do the procedures, and sometimes afterward, the veterinarians invited me to sit around a large wooden table you know, with donuts in the center, and they would talk about their patients. Very, very similar to what I'd been doing for many, many years in the human hospital. And it was during these rounds that I would I started hearing the veterinarians having conversations about the management of metastatic breast cancer in a lion, or the dosing of insulin in a brittle diabetic mandrill, or even how to use Prozac, fluoxetine, in a compulsive bear. And as I started listening to these rounds, um, every time I went, it started to really um, make me um, confused, um, excited. I, I didn't know what to do with all of this comparative information, but it seemed to me that there was, there was an opportunity here, potentially, to improve how I functioned as a cardiologist. There was something in there, but I didn't know what it was yet. So eventually, I did a lot of thinking, and I went back to that first patient, to, to Pandora. And I went back and I looked at that echocardiogram. And this is what I saw when I put that probe down her esophagus. This was Pandora's heart. And it's beating. This is the left ventricle and the left atrium, the right ventricle and the right atrium. And I hope you can see that there are these bouncing balls, right? Can you see that? Oh, yeah. Those are blood clots. And there are a number of abnormalities with this heart. And, um, this, but this was a very prominent finding. As soon as I looked at that echo, it reminded me of a human echocardiogram that I had done some weeks earlier. And the findings were remarkably similar. Um, the structural findings in the atrium were similar, and these blood clots. And it turned out, I'll shorten the story, but it turned out both this human patient and this chimpanzee had the same form of, it's called an infiltrative cardiomyopathy. But what 
I started to sort of think about what it, it, it sparked in me were two thoughts. First, if a human being and a chimpanzee can both develop this problem, and we'll talk about the issue of captivity um, soon, that suggests, at least it begs the question, does the common ancestor, did the common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees, was she also vulnerable to the same form of infiltrative cardiomyopathy? And the second question it sparked was, what are the other diseases that humans and animals share vulnerability to? Because at that point, I didn't know. So I started asking questions. And by the way, this is the side by side. I asked, are animals vulnerable to breast cancer? How about prostate cancer? Brain tumors? Yes. Are animals vulnerable to concussions, to seizure disorders, to asthma? Yes. And since I'm interested in women's health, I was curious about female animals. And I asked, are female animals vulnerable to polycystic ovarian syndrome, or endometriosis, or infertility? And the answer is yes. Now, it is more accurate to say it, saying that human doctors don't know this or we are ignorant is really only partially true. It's more accurate to say that the field, my field, has forgotten something that was known 150 years ago and before. In fact, Rudolf Virchow, who is considered one of the fathers of modern medicine, wrote, in the 19th century, between animal and human medicine, there is no dividing line, nor should there be. The object is different, but the experience obtained constitutes the basis of all medicine. Well, I've been thinking a lot over the last 10 years about how this comparative information, how we can use it to improve how we understand the, the nature of disease and the essence of vulnerability to disease. And what I want to do today is I want to share with you um, five different conditions, and use these conditions to try to um, bring you along, to really convince you that when we take human medicine and we bring in the animal case, comparative information, and we bring evolution into this, that we can generate new questions. We can spark novel hypotheses. And we can encourage paths of investigation that wouldn't be possible if we weren't thinking comparatively. So that's what I want to do. And I'm going to start with a case, a cancer, a case in cancer, which I think really um, shows some incredible potential. First, the human case. There is a rare hereditary condition called Lee-Fermeni syndrome. And people who are affected have, there's a high incidence of childhood cancer. And affected individuals have a nearly 100% lifetime cancer incidence. Why are they so vulnerable to cancer? Because they have a problem with their P53 tumor suppressor gene. I'm sorry for those over here, but um, it's on chromosome 17. And healthy humans are born with one of these genes with two functioning alleles. But people who are born with this syndrome have only one functioning allele, the human case. Let's talk about the animal case. So, about 40 years ago, um, a statistician in England, he, he made a comment. He said, he made an observation. He said, well, cancer is caused by mutations. And mutations occur when cells divide. So he thought, doesn't it stand to reason that animals who are very, very big, who require more cell divisions, should all be riddled with cancer? In other words, it takes 100,000 times more cell divisions to create me than to create a mouse. And an elephant is about 100 times bigger than I am. So he, he asked this question. It seemed odd to him that if that's all that was happening, that every whale and every elephant wouldn't be riddled with cancer. But no one had ever tested this until about three years ago, when a group of, um, of human physicians and veterinarians and evolutionary biologists got together. And here's what they did. First, they looked at the elephant genome. And what did they find? They found that elephants have 20 copies of TP53. 
Now, let me just go back to this TP53 gene. What does it do? This gene is responsible. It helps with cancer suppression. So if you're a healthy human, you have two functioning alleles of P53. And one of the things that P53 does is it induces this um, programmed cell death if there's too much DNA damage in a cell. In other words, if it looks like that cell is destined to become a cancer cell, it induces this sequence of self-destruction. It's called apoptosis, and it's a very important component of cancer suppression that should be functioning in healthy animals, apoptosis. Well, it turned out that African elephants have 20 copies of P53. Remember, humans have one copy of P53. But that didn't really prove anything. That didn't prove that elephants had some inherent cancer suppression. So they took it a step farther. They drew blood from elephants. And by the way, look at this anterior flap of an African elephant's ear. You can see this beautiful vasculature. So they took blood from these elephants. These were elephants um, uh, in the United States, captive elephants. And they also drew blood from healthy humans and human beings who had lefromani. And then they exposed the blood cells to radiation. They were trying to damage the DNA. They wanted to see whether or not there would be apoptosis. Remember, apoptosis is cancer suppression. And what did they find? That the amount of apoptosis in elephants was about three times, two to three times the amount in healthy humans, and significantly more than individuals with Lee Fromani syndrome. And actually, they kind of created a dose response curve that um, suggested that the number of functioning alleles of this very important gene correlated to the amount of cancer-suppressing apoptosis. This was really exciting because this suggested that as elephants, potentially as they, um, about 30 million years ago is when elephants started to, the, the proboscinean line started to increase in size. And this suggests that in conjunction with that evolution of larger size, there was this evolution of this cancer suppression mechanism. And because we're sitting in this wonderful museum, I have to show the proboscinean lineage because it's fascinating to look at, um, at, uh, at the mastodon and at the mammoth. So if you look at this lineage, um, this is an African elephant. Uh, there's a common ancestor with the manatee and the hyrax. And this actually shows whether there's an increased number of P53. And these smaller animals do not have amplification. But here, we see 20 copies in the African elephant. And if you look at the Colombian mammoth and the woolly mammoth, you see amplification. That is an increased number of copies. And even the mastodon, you see increased copies. I have to tell you, um, I'm, it was such an exciting thing to think about this, that um, I went and I went, walked through um, the museum this morning. And as you walk through the Museum of Comparative Zoology and you're coming, and you come by that magnificent giant sloth, well, as you're staring at that sloth, if you're able to turn yourself away to the right, there's, this, there's the, Harvard, there's the uh, Harvard mastodon. And actually, I looked in the collection, has a number of mastodon species. Why is that interesting, um, a, a number of specimens? Because when you're walking through the museum, it's not just a tour of animals. You're actually looking at the evolution of cancer suppression in an elephant. That is exciting. It's a new lens. All right, that's, that's cancer. Let's move to heart disease. All right, so heart disease, it's what I know. It's the leading cause of death, um, and it's a very significant problem. And the vast majority of people who will die of heart disease die of this disease. It's called atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis is a disease of the arteries of the body that occurs when cholesterol enters the wall. And it causes the narrowing and the blockages, heart attacks, and strokes. OK. Now, I spent my life taking care of patients with atherosclerosis. And I know that at least 80% of the time, most individuals who are vulnerable 
They can prevent developing atherosclerosis if they just do these things. And you all know what they are. Don't smoke. Manage your blood pressure. Be active. Don't be obese. If you have high cholesterol, treat it, et cetera, et cetera. But just because these cases in individuals, you can reduce their risk with these, um, by these strategies, does that suggest that atherosclerosis doesn't occur without these bad human habits and practices? The answer is no. Because atherosclerosis has been found in a range of animals, just the mammals here, from a giant panda, a dromedary camel, <coughs> elephants, walrus, alpaca, and whales. And if we're going to talk about whales and coronary artery disease, I have to show you this, because this was a blue whale that um, was beached on the western shore of Newfoundland in 2014. And they did a magnificent thing. They, they did a, a very high quality necropsy, and then they extracted the heart. And you don't see a, a <laughs> blue whale heart every day of the week. Um, this is just thrilling to look at. You can see, I'm not going to go into detail, but you can see the um, coronary arteries and the veins. The veins are blue. The coronary arteries are red. Um, and actually, if there are any cardiologists in the group who've done an angiogram, or anyone who's ever had an angiogram, or any students who are going to do angiograms, I have to show you two things. One, this is the aorta of the, um, the whale. And notice the relative size of this man's arm. But here's an exciting comparative fact. In every mammal, the first artery to come off the aorta, so here's your heart, here's the aorta, the first artery that comes off is always the coronary artery. That is the artery that's going to feed blood and oxygen to the heart muscle. Why? Because the heart has to feed itself. And that relationship is conserved across mammals, which is so exciting because what it means to me, so here's the aorta, and here you can see this is the coronary artery. It's been cut, but it goes down here, is that if you were going to do an angiogram on a whale, a blue whale, this is where you would insert your cannula and you'd inject your dye. Not that we're going to do it, but it's just so, um, the connection is so exciting and, and real. Well, let's talk, we're going to talk about aortic uh, atherosclerosis. We're going to need to have a conversation about captivity. And I want to roll it back a little bit, because when I first started talking about disease in humans and animals and looking into the literature, most of the literature is on captive animals for obvious reasons. That's what is accessible. And in the beginning, I used to um, sort of underrepresent the value of information from captive animals to human health. I had a kind of reflexive idea that, well, it's captivity that's causing the problem, so what does that have to do with the essence of disease? But as time has gone on, I have not only come to um, not agree with that initial perspective, I've actually come to feel exactly the opposite for a couple of reasons. The first I'm going to share now, and the second in a moment or two. First, because Increasingly, it's probably better to characterize our human lives as um, semi-captive than wild, and that, in fact, many of the stressors and the environmental effects associated with captivity are real and happening in our free human lives. The, the next reason I'll get to in a moment, but captivity and wild become important distinctions, but as we talk more and more about the essential vulnerability to disease, um, they become less, it becomes less well demarked. So let's talk about atherosclerosis in other animals. So there are lots of birds who are vulnerable to atherosclerosis, both captive birds and wild birds. Um, these turkeys are, are turkeys who are grown for uh, consumption, are well known to develop atherosclerosis. Their aortas can become quite atheromatous, and this is actually an aorta. This is a CT, a CAT scan of an aorta. And if you see this bulge, this is a, an aneurysm that's caused by atherosclerosis and this can rupture. And turkeys, it's not an uncommon cause of death for turkeys to have an abdominal aortic rupture. And um, just because we want to make a human comparison, this happens to human beings um, with fairly uh, significant frequency. Uh, it's been the cause of death of um, many, many prominent people, probably the most famous of whom was Albert Einstein, also had an uh, atherosclerotic aortic aneurysm. But what about wild birds? That's captive birds. What about wild birds? Well, atherosclerosis has been found in some series to affect 
30% of wild-caught birds in the UK and even in one small study from Eastern Africa. And among free-living pigeons, this was actually, um, these were pigeons that were living around Mosul, uh, Iraq, uh, interestingly, 10% had significant atherosclerosis. Well, if we're going to talk about wild animals and atherosclerosis, we have to define a few things. What we're talking about is a diagnosis that's made under a microscope with a necropsy. A necropsy is a, 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 an autopsy on an animal. And we're not talking necessarily about a heart attack or a stroke, although there are examples of wild animals who on necropsy, that is, have evidence of myocardial uh, ischemia, that is, there's been a kind of a heart damage from a blocked artery. But probably the largest, the largest series of wild animal atherosclerosis that I know of was published in 1967. And it came from a group from the University of Pennsylvania and from McGill. These were veterinary pathologists who went to Lake Edward in Queen Elizabeth National Park in Uganda. And there was, um, over a period of time, they did pretty high quality necropsies, at least for the 1967 period, and they found that of the 72 hippopotami that they looked at, and these were hippopotamus necropsies, they found that the majority had some atherosclerosis, not in their coronary arteries, but in their aortas. And by the way, just reading that was so disruptive for me because, again, as a human cardiologist, I think about atherosclerosis as being a disease of civilization. And indeed, as I said, we significantly amplify the risk of atherosclerosis, of heart attacks and strokes, by smoking, by obesity, by all the things we know. However, what we learn from the fact of atherosclerosis in a hippopotamus in Africa in 1960s is that the essential vulnerability to atherosclerosis may be ancient and conserved. And uh, this is actually um, a section, uh, this is a picture that they published in, um, in the journal, and this is a piece of, an, of a hippopotamus aorta, and this is a human aorta, and this is atherosclerosis, this waxy, yellowish material. This is atherosclerosis. And so if you take in a little piece, you see that there's you know, an atherosclerotic plaque there. And my favorite part of the study was that they then looked at the teeth of the hippopotami. And they, set, they, they identified the age of the hippopotamus based on the amount of wear and tear of the teeth. And then they looked at the amount, the severity of atherosclerosis, and they saw that with increasing age, there was more atherosclerosis and calcification, which I won't get into, but that's so interesting too. Why? Because in our species, as we get older, there is increasing severity of atherosclerosis and calcification. Now, why do we care? What does this mean for human health? Well, it immediately sparks so many questions in my head. Number one, well, why do, do the aortas have atherosclerosis and not the arteries that are feeding blood and uh, oxygen to the heart muscle? I mean, in our species, we have atherosclerosis of the aorta, and almost always it affects the coronary arteries. That's one question. The second question would be, what, what is it about getting older uh, in a hippopotamus that makes them more vulnerable, that adds to the severity? Does it have to do with some developmental effect? And what about inflammation? We know that inflammation plays a significant role in driving atherosclerosis in our species. And while inflammation can be caused by inflammatory diets and all the things we're talking about, infectious pathogens, parasites and viruses and bacteria can also cause inflammation. And in fact, we know that in some cases of human atherosclerosis, infectious pathogens are implicated. Now, I don't have any answers. But I do know that there are many, many questions that are disruptive, that are interesting and relevant. These questions you cannot even think about or ask unless you're aware of the occurrence of aortic atherosclerosis in a wild hippopotamus in Africa in the 1960s. It allows for those questions. Well, there are many kinds of heart disease 
in addition to atherosclerosis. And there's one that I want to tell you about because um, it's been of interest to me for many years, partly because I was once a psychiatrist. And that is stress-induced cardiomyopathy. All right, so for years, cardiologists have known that stress is bad for our health, right? We talk about chronic stress. And chronic stress causes us to have problems with hypertension and many other issues. But acute stress, that's the stress that happens in, you know, in your proximate, you know, an hour ago, a few minutes ago, yesterday. Acute stress also can be dangerous for the cardiovascular system of humans. I experienced this um, personally on January the 17th, 1994, when Los Angeles, we had the last um, major earthquake um, in, in the region. And it was a 6.7 magnitude earthquake, um, but it had the fastest ground acceleration of any measured earthquake in North America. And it jolted us from sleep at 4.30 in the morning. Um, I will never forget it. First of all, um, I was a newlywed, so that was um, uh, very notable. But also, I was chief resident in internal medicine at UCLA and um, went right to the uh, hospital where we, had, we were flooded with patients who were having a variety of problems, including lots and lots of chest pain. And if you think about it, it was terrifying. I was really scared. Um, my husband was really scared. Everyone in Los Angeles County simultaneously woke up, was woken from sleep at 4.30 in the morning. All of our heart rates skyrocketed. All of our blood pressures skyrocketed. And so the study that was done, you'll see, is in a way not that surprising. Several of my colleagues, um, after about a year after the earthquake, um, asked the question, were there more heart attacks on January the 17th, 1994, than would have been predicted. And what they did was they looked at January the 17th, 1994, and you can see this spike here, and they compared it with the other days in the month, and then they compared January 1994 to 93 to 92, 91. And by the way, this has been, um, this kind of study has been done with uh, terror attacks, it's been done with hurricanes, and it's even been done, believe it or not, with sporting events, and that's another fascinating story. The point is that the brain is connected to the heart through a very complex nexus of nerves, and what happens to us emotionally, particularly when we're scared under high stress, when the adrenaline, the catecholamines in our body um, are surging, can affect our, our hearts. And to be a tiny bit technical, what's happening often in these cases is that the, um, it's called stress, cardiomyopathy, cardio for heart, and myopathy for heart, for, for muscle, right? Sickness of the mu muscle, pathology of the muscle. And we see that there's an abnormality in the ventricle um, when this happens. So I've known this for a long time, and I knew this one day when I went to the LA Zoo when they were requesting uh, an echocardiogram on Spitzbuben, who was one of the tamarin there, who they were worried about heart failure. And I remember this day so well because I got to the zoo, excited to do my echo, and I and Spitzbuben was tiny. So the tamarin are these little, um, they're very small. They're about the size of a large newborn, right? And they live in the canopy of the rainforest in Central and South America. They're endangered. The LA Zoo has a pretty big collection. Um, but and so, such beautiful, beautiful animals. So, I couldn't resist. The animal was in a little enclosure. I walked very close, and I was trying to kind of make contact, you know, connect the way I'd connect to a human patient, maybe a child. And the vet, I feel this hand on my shoulder. I'm being pushed back. And she says, you know what? You are scaring Spitzbuben. You are going to give her capture myopathy. <laughs> and I, you know, I did, obviously, I, I stepped back. I didn't want to scare the animal. I'd never heard of capture myopathy. But just the name gave me an idea that this might be something that was connected to stress cardiomyopathy. And then I learned, and I just couldn't stop learning, that animals from birds to um, hoofstock to um, just a range of animals, when they are very, very scared, particularly when they are captured by wildlife biologists, for example, that they can have a surge of adrenaline that in some species can result in a 10%, up to a 10% rate of death. Now, these are two animals. Uh, this is a pika, and this is a marmot. And um, so 
the pika, pika are they're really, they're, they're adorable. They're these round animals with these rounded ears. And um, there's a species of pika that lives in the upper altitudes of the Rocky Mountains. And colleagues of mine who work with them have told me that when you pick up a pika and you hold them too tightly, that they're very sensitive, that they can actually die in your hands, that they have this, um, this sensitivity. Whereas the marmot, and marmots are, um, they're actually also in the Rockies. They belong, they're more, they're a squirrel species, they're, so they're not that closely related. But they're very, you can pick them up, you can phlebotomize them, and they really don't have this problem. So this is so, it was so interesting um, for me to learn, because this suggests that vulnerability to stress cardiomyopathy, potentially, or to capture myopathy, differs between species. Why is this important to human health? What can we learn? Well, when you take the human and you bring in the animal, you start seeing questions like, what is the mechanism that underlies this vulnerability in the pica and this resistance in the marmot? What is happening? Why? Can we apply that to the human case? But beyond that, there's another opportunity. Because looking between species can be helpful. But as a cardiologist who takes care of one species, I'm interested in identifying which of my patients, which of the people here, which of a group of human beings are going to be vulnerable with the next earthquake or the next hurricane, predicting who is at risk, vulnerability. And there's um, an opportunity in studying birds. Why birds? Because it turns out um, that a number of shorebird species who are heavily studied by wildlife biologists are very vulnerable to capture myopathy. And in fact, what happens often is these birds are cannon netted. So they release a, there's a, there's a, a cannon that um, releases the net. The net unfurls and lands on the birds. And then you know, the birds are phlebotomized and tagged and whatever. But that in some species, again, there's up to a 10% rate of death. I'm going to show you a group of wild biologists, wildlife biologists working very quickly to do what they need to do. And you'll see the birds in this um, net and that they're struggling. And in fact, they're, um, you can just imagine the adrenaline, the catecholamine surging, and how frightening it is for these birds. The wildlife biologists need to do this. This is, this is important work. But you see that they're working quickly aware of this risk. Why is this important? Because my question would be, which of those birds are at risk and which of those birds are not, and why? Is it something developmental? That is, does it have to do with how old they are? Does it have to do with the season that they were born? Does it have to do with some exposures that they had uh, when they were you know, embryos? Or what is happening? These are questions looking within a group for a variation of vulnerability that's highly relevant to human health. All right, I want to move from heart disease. I'm going to move on to obesity. And there is no more significant a problem in human medicine today than obesity. It is affecting everything from pediatrics to OBGYN. Um, and at this point, you know, there are some states in the United States where 30 to 35 percent of the adults and the children fall not into the overweight category, but in the obese category, right? So we know this is a very, very significant issue. And there's a, again, a global effort trying to um, deal with, arrest this problem, reverse this problem. But there's an opportunity, I think, that may be um, right in front of us, hiding in plain sight on the other end of the leash. And that is to look at dogs. All right, so America's favorite breed is the Labrador, right? The Labrador Retriever. And this is one of the most famous Labradors in England, in the UK. This is Mike. Um, does anybody know about Mike? Mike has his own Facebook page. So OK, well, Mike, uh, Mike was a, a very, very obese lab who was rescued after his owner died of obesity-related disease, um, which is not that surprising. And he ended up, he became a, a national phenomenon. He weighed, um, he weighed 60 kilograms, so he was really, really overweight. And there was this national campaign, and he ended up slimming down and everything. Well, labs, it turns out, Mike was obese for, for some obvious reasons and maybe some other non-obvious reasons. When we have dogs in our home, if we're under-exercising and we're overeating, it's really likely that we're under-exercising our animals and we are overfeeding them as well. And that's part of it. But there's also a genetic component, right? 
dog breeds, over the last 150 years, we humans have been you know, aggressively selecting specific physical and behavioral phenotypes. Right? We've been pulling in the genes we want for cute floppy tails, for flat faces, for excellent hunting ability. Right? So when we pull in those genes for what we want, we may pull in genes that we do or don't want. Well, the genetics of obesity in dogs has been, is only now kind of coming to the fore. Why? Because while labs and golden seem to have a genetic predisposition to obesity, on the other end of the spectrum, there are breeds of dogs that you basically cannot make fat. Right? Um, so we, we're talking about, I'm talking about, um, and this is an Italian greyhound, and this is a Saluki, but also Afghan hounds and um, uh, whippets, for example. Why is it? What underlies this biology? Is this a natural animal model of leanness that is hiding in plain sight? And there are many opportunities like this to look for, looking at canine, at, uh, canine genomics, for example, but also looking at other features um, specific to dog breeds. Well, obesity is a big problem, heart disease, cancer. And I might have ended the talk there, but I'm not going to. Um, I want to talk about biobehavioral problems. And behavior is, human behavior, animal behavior, is much more complex than, in some ways, than um, somatic disease. Why do I say that? Well, if I'm looking at cancer, a breast cancer, for example, under a microscope, breast cancer in a human being under a microscope is going to look a lot like breast cancer in a jaguar or a beluga whale or a dog. And breast cancer happens in all of those species. Behavior is more complicated. And so I offer this caveat before I go on, which is to say um, we have to be skeptical when we're looking at animal behavior, even if it phenomenologically looks like human behavior. We have to um, maintain that skepticism, but at the same time, I think it's important that we um, create these comparisons and ask important questions. All right. So let's start with compulsive disorders. There are a number of conditions that cause compulsive disorders in, uh, comp compulsions in human beings. OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, is the most common, but it's not the only one. One in 40 adults have OCD. About one in 100 children have OCD. And there are a number of compulsions associated with that disorder. Um, in 1991, Judith Rappaport, who uh, it was the head of child psychiatry at the National Institutes of Mental Health, wrote a book called The Boy Who Couldn't Stop Washing. And it was about compulsive hand washing in um, OCD. And in fact, we know that one of the most common compulsions in OCD is grooming, hand washing, and other grooming activities. And it turns out that if you look at compulsions in animals, many of them um, revolve also around grooming. I'm going to show you a dog who has a compulsive grooming syndrome. You can see this is called acrolic dermatitis, or compulsive licking. And this dog will lick and lick and lick his paw until the fur is removed, until the epithelium is exposed, until the skin cracks. This is a compulsive disorder which uh, is causing harm to the animal physically and may be causing ha harm to the animal um, emotionally. That's a projection, in the and of course, we want to be um, cautious. But the phenomenology of overgrooming is hard to see and not think about overgrooming in humans. Now, what kinds of questions can we ask? What does this cause? Well, do the triggers for this, um, for, for this overgrooming, this lick syndrome in dogs, are they similar to the triggers of um, excessive hand washing in humans? And what about the genomics of the breeds that are vulnerable? And what about the fact that selective serotonin drugs like Prozac and Paxil and Zoloft are effective in treating dogs like this and also effective in treating some humans with OCD? Does that suggest? that the underlying mechanism is similar or even potentially the same? These are all important questions. And they are questions that can lead to novel hypotheses and different kinds of investigations. But we have to be thinking comparatively to even ask the question. 
there are other kinds of compulsions beyond grooming. This is um, a video of a young student, a young man, who has a compulsive pacing disorder. And he, he essentially just, uh, you know, he paces back and forth. Why does he do this? What triggers it? What is his underlying genetic substrate um, upon which these stressors act to create this pacing? Good questions and important questions for him and for others. A comparative um, perspective, it's pretty well known that polar bears in captivity, most of them um, start to pace at some point. It's iconic, the pacing polar bear. You've probably seen this in a zoo um, or an aquarium. And in fact, many polar bears in captivity um, are on drugs like Prozac, et cetera, to kind of contain this. Well, and actually, this is an interesting case because in this case, the pacing is entrained. The two bears are, it's, it's become entrained. So when you see pacing in a human and you see this compulsive pacing in these bears, you know, it really, um, it's an invitation to, with, um, with skepticism, but still with curiosity, to ask, what is the underlying mechanism? What other questions? I want to know, do polar bears do this not in captivity? Do they do this in an, arc, uh, an ice flow in the Arctic? If they do, that's interesting. If they don't, that's very interesting too. I want to know, what is it about the stress of captivity that's inducing this behavior and perpetuating this behavior? And can that give us a clue about what induces and perpetuates pacing in this young man? So I want to come back to the issue of captivity. Because when I started my comparative voyage, I was very skeptical about what we could learn about human health from captive animals. But not only do I believe that we humans in many ways are more captive than we are wild, and so there's a lot to learn from that perspective, but I also now believe that it's inaccurate to say that captivity causes disease. Captivity is not causing this pacing. It's more accurate to say that captivity unmasks essential vulnerability. And that message that we share as human beings an essential vulnerability to disease is at the heart of, of what I'm exploring and excited about. Because I think we have ignored um, this really rich opportunity to understand ourselves in a different way and to really pursue science in a more expansive, um, in, from a more expanded species-spanning perspective. Well, the first example I gave you was of elephants, that, that this discovery that elephants have multiple copies of this cancer suppression gene. The scientists who did that study, they have actually now synthesized elephant P53 because it turns out the protein in elephants is more powerful than the comparable protein in humans. They're synthesizing it and they actually are planning a clinical trial to introduce elephant P53 as a cancer prevention strategy for human beings with leaf Romani syndrome, right? That's the syndrome where humans have only one functioning allele of P53. Now, I have no idea whether that's going to work, right? I, I have no idea. But what I do know is that that investigation, that idea, and this, um, and this potential therapy would never even have started. It would never have occurred if a veterinarian and a physician hadn't fought collectively using evolutionary biology um, as a framework to come up with this question. Without the comparative perspective, you can't ask questions that are inspired by comparative information. It's, it's obvious. Well, I don't want to wait another 40 years for, it was 1970 that this, um, this idea was launched by this British statistician. I don't want to wait another four years to have these questions asked. And remember, powerful research starts by asking the right questions. It starts with questions. So we don't want to wait. We don't want to wait for some serendipitous observation about commonality between animals and humans. I want to kind of light the fire and make it happen. So I've been um, creating over the last, since 2011, 
I've been um, creating conferences where I bring together medical school faculty and veterinary school faculty, and I have these doctors talk about atrial fibrillation in a horse and atrial fibrillation in a human and breast cancer in a jaguar and breast cancer in a human and so on and so forth. This is the handshake that I want to have duplicated around the world. Um, this was actually our first ubiquity conference. This was the Gene Washington, who was the dean of UCLA Medical School at the time, and this was Benny Osborne, who was the dean of UC Davis School of Veterinary Medicine. And um, what happens when you bring physicians and veterinarians together and then you bring in this evolutionary perspective is that all kinds of new questions are asked. And I'm very proud that there are all kinds of investigations and partnerships and collaborations that have happened as a consequence of our now seven U.S. ubiquity conference and two international. All right. Well, I'm going to um, end in a moment and I'm going to ask you um, to do something. I'm going to ask you to take this lens and try it on. Take my lens and try it on. Because I'm going to tell you that not only does thinking comparatively um, shift and transform how you understand science and think about medical problems, it transforms how you experience the natural world. It, it, it takes a trip to the beach where you see a sea lion diving, sea lion diving into the ocean and you see the beautiful animal, but you also see the ability of this animal to slow her heart rate down in order to um, preserve and conserve the, the heart's need for oxygen. Um, it's called the diving reflex. And you can connect it to um, a component of that reflex that is preserved in young humans. And it sometimes saves the life of a, an infant or a young child if they fall into the water. It can be the reason that a young child survives a near drowning. It transforms what it's like to um, sit in your backyard and look at birds, or go on a hike in the Blue Hills or Walden Pond. And it transforms your experience of your dog, who's sitting on the ground on a, next to you on a cold New England night. But it also can transform what it's like walking through a museum, like our magnificent Museum of Comparative Zoology here. Um, I had the great privilege of walking through the Hall of Mammals with Mark Omura last week. And as we walked from room to room, it was in a lot of ways like being on medical rounds. It was this additional perspective. We could have just walked by the red kangaroo and the gorgeous giraffe and seen a beautiful kangaroo and a beautiful giraffe, but instead we saw two animals whose hearts thicken over their lives but who never develop heart failure the way human beings who have thickened hearts develop heart failure. We could have just walked past the Indian and the Javanese rhinos and the, uh, the Burmese python and seen two amazing, three amazing animals, but instead we saw three animals who share this vulnerability that their blood, their bone marrow, shares a vulnerability to lymphoblastic leukemia which also human beings are vulnerable to. And we could have just walked past the jaguar. We got into that, that room, which is South America. We could have just walked past the jaguar and, and seen a jaguar. But instead, we saw vulnerability to breast cancer. And then if you're looking at that jaguar and you just turn yourself around 180 degrees, you see 300 species of hummingbirds. And when you see those birds, you can just look at the beautiful birds, or you can see a group of birds that, despite very high blood sugars, seem resistant to vascular disease. It's very, very exciting. So I'm going to invite you to, to sort of have some of that excitement in just a moment. We're going to go over and look at our specimens. We have a hippopotamus um, that was given to the zoo, uh, to the museum from the Boston Society. It, it's probably around a 1920s specimen. There is a gorilla that was brought to the museum in 1930s from an expedition. And this gorilla appears to have a congenital abnormality, a facial abnormality um, on the maxillary bone. And one of the arm bones is also curved. And in human medicine, we know there is an association between abnormalities of the face and abnormalities of the upper extremity. 
So that's possibly what we're looking at, a shared congenital syndrome. There, um, there are a number of specimens um, that are pertainable to women's health. Increasingly, we want to think about, um, I like thinking about female animals. I like to use female examples. And we have um, a dolphin, um, the uterus of a dolphin. We have um, a wolf, a female wolf. And we also have a beautiful lion specimen. And I didn't talk a lot about breast cancer, but it turns out that um, big cats seem to have some increased vulnerability. These are really interesting questions. Anyway, I'm excited by this. And I'm going to end by just um, hoping that I've convinced you that when we take human medicine, and we bring in animal medicine, that, and then we expose both fields to an evolutionary perspective that we can think in a different way, ask important new questions. And by doing that, maybe, hopefully, we can find a new way to investigate and find prevention strategies, maybe even cures, that will help not only our species, but maybe all of the patients on the planet.